In this video, I'm going to talk about charge distributions and how they can produce electric fields. We're going to have a look at some of the concepts in calculus and integration that you can use to solve these types of problems. So what is the area of electromagnetism that these types of problems emerge in? Well, it's electrostatics. And statics means that things don't change with respect to time. And electro, that's the prefix for electric fields. So electrostatics are when you don't have changing electric fields. You just have charges that have always been there, and they're not going to move. So there's always a consistent electric field emanating from these charges. Let's have a look at some common charge distributions. So a lot of the time, you're going to see a line of charge, like a wire that's charged, but there's no flow. Remember, this is electrostatics. There's no flow of current. There's just charges arranged in a line. So this is a line of charge. And for these types of situations, you're going to want to use the quantity of linear charge density. And linear charge density is represented by the Greek letter lambda. And the units are charge per unit length, right? Charge per unit length. So that's Coulomb per meter. These are the SI units for linear charge density. So what, what is a little chunk of a little chunk DL going to look like? Well, it's going to be a tiny infinitesimal slice of this line. And so what you can actually do to calculate how the electric field would change is you need to calculate how the charge is distributed. So what is the charge going to be? Well, the charge you can also break up as a little dq. So what we could do is we could have a tiny little dq. So that's dq. This is a, a lowercase q. And that is an infinitesimal little chunk of charge. And what is the dq going to be in this situation? Well, it's actually going to be the linear charge density lambda times dl. Let's see if the units match up. This has the unit of charge. This is in coulombs, in SI units. This over here is coulombs per meter, or charge per unit length. And this has units of length. This is in meters. So the units of length are going to cancel, and you're just going to be left with coulombs. So this is actually the amount of charge that would lie in every little chunk over here. So then if you, were, if you wanted to calculate the electric field, you would integrate all of these little charges, and you would also take into consideration their distance from a point. So electric field is always calculated at a point. So if you're looking at some location up here, at some point over here, there would be a distance, r, from that dl. And you would take that distance, you would square it, you go 1 over r squared. Why 1 over r squared? Well, it's because we know that point charges, point charges behave uh, in accordance to Coulomb's law. Right? So Coulomb's law for force tells you that there's a 1 over r squared relationship. And if you're looking for electric fields, you just remove one of those charges from Coulomb's law because you're just interested in the force per unit charge. That's what the electric field is concerned with. So this is our first step to working out something that has a linear charge density. What if it's not on a straight line? Or it doesn't actually have to be straight. It could be some kind of one-dimensional line. What if it's not on a one-dimensional line? What if it's on a surface? What if all of these little uh, chunks of charge are distributed evenly on a surface? Or what if, what if it's not even an even distribution? What if there's some variation? What if there's a lot of charge near the middle and not a lot of charge on the outside? How would we deal with that kind of electrostatics problem? Well, we'd have a look at surface charge density. And that's this situation over here. So imagine we have some kind of surface. This is any two-dimensional surface. Uh, it has some kind of charge distribution. How would we quantify that distribution? Well, we would use the surface charge density. And that's represented by the Greek letter sigma. So over here we had lambda, that's the linear charge density. And now we have sigma, the surface charge density. The units are different. Here we have coulomb per meter squared. So this is charge per unit area. Over here we had charge per unit length. Now we have charge per unit area. So what we're interested in is a tiny infinitesimal area, which we can call dA. Sometimes this is called dS for a surface, if you're doing a surface integral. Because what you will actually end up having to do is an integral over this surface. But you're going to take each of the charges in each of the tiny little chunks dA. So how would a little chunk of charge, how would it look like in the surface charge density case? Well, we would have something like dQ. This is a tiny little dq. That's going to be equal to sigma 
times dA, right? Sigma times dA. Make that A a little bit better. There we go. So this is a tiny, tiny little chunk of area. You can think of it as dx by dy if it's Cartesian coordinates. And this over here is the surface charge density. That's the charge per unit area. So again, the units work out. Here we have units of charge. Here we have charge per area multiplied by area. So the units of area, which in SI units is meters squared, they're going to cancel out. And so we'll be left with coulombs, or units of charge. Now let's have a look at something that is an extra dimension. So we've had one dimension, uh, two dimensions, and now we're going to have a three-dimensional system, and that is volume, right? Volume charge density is our next quantity that, of interest. So volume charge density is useful if you have a three-dimensional charge distribution. So there's charge everywhere in 3D space, and each, each point in 3D space has a value associated with it. So rho, the Greek letter rho, is used to denote volume charge density. Now, in the previous two examples, we also had this little infinitesimal. What is the infinitesimal in the volume charge density case? Well, it's dv. And I've drawn a little cube to illustrate dv. So in Cartesian coordinates, this would be dx, dy, dz. So dx, dy, dz is a tiny, tiny little cube in 3D space. And when we're doing the integrals for all of these, we're going to take the limit as these infinitesimals go to zero. Right? It, uh, an integral is essentially a sum with some limits. And the limits uh, state that this guy has to go to zero, this guy has to go to zero, and this guy has to go to zero. So they're never actually equal to zero. We just take the limit as they approach zero. And we see what uh, value we get from our integral. So how would a tiny chunk of, of charge look like in this scenario? Well, we've seen the pattern so far. So dq would be equal to a tiny little increment of charge, or a tiny little chunk of charge, which is going to be a tiny volume times the density. So it's going to be rho dv. And let's check the units again. So dq, that's units of charge. This is charge per unit volume. And this is volume. So volume, and we have per unit volume, those guys are going to cancel out, and we'll be just left with uh, units of charge. In SI units, both of these sides are going to be coulombs. So we'll have coulombs on both sides. So then what we would do is we would actually take each of these tiny little chunks, and we would integrate them with respect to all of this so over the entire uh, domain. right? So the domain could be a line. The domain could be a surface, or the domain could be a volume in three-dimensional space. In general, in 3D space, if you want the total charge, what you would do is you would go Q, the total charge, is equal to the volume integral. So we need three integral signs over the volume. This is some kind of volume that's enclosed by a surface, times rho dv. Right? This over here is the total charge from a 3D scenario, where there's a three-dimensional charge distribution. You can actually think of the, the charge density as a scalar field. There's no direction associated with any of the values, but every point in space has a scalar value. So what you can do is you can integrate the entire 3D space, and what you will get is the total charge Q. So how would we go from getting this tiny infinitesimal charge to the electric field? Well, if you know, uh, from Coulomb's law, as we discussed before, you would integrate that and you would sum up over all of the charges. So the electric field would be the force per unit charge at any point. And so you would pick some point. So if, if we picked a point over here, what we'd have is a contribution from this little chunk, right? There'd be a contribution from there. There'd be a contribution from all of these little chunks. And if you picked another point over here, this point, would get a contribution from here, from here, from here, from here, from here, all of these points. And this is actually one of the reasons why integral calculus was invented. So Isaac Newton was actually dealing with these kinds of problems. And it took him a long time to actually uh, rigorously define integration and to work it out in three dimensions. Right? Because intuitively, it seems like the electric field at this point has to be due to all of these charges. But how do you prove it? Well, you do the integral. And it turns out it's a volume integral. It's a triple integral. 
dx, dy, dz, you've got if it's in Cartesian coordinates, and you have to integrate all of this, take all the contributions of all of these tiny little infinitesimal charges, the dqs, and that's going to give you the entire contribution of charge. And so then you can apply Gauss's law for electric fields. And Gauss's law for electric fields tells you that if you take a surface and you enclose a bunch of charge, right, it could be some kind of continuous charge distribution, it could be point charges, those guys are going to produce a electric flux. So there's going to be an electric field coming through the surface. If there's no charges inside that surface, there's not going to be any electric field. So if you have any, if you pick a surface in empty space and there's no charges there, there's going to be no electric flux through that surface. So Gauss's law for electric fields is what you would use after you have figured out this kind of charge distribution. So this video has, uh, it has the aim of just giving you a brief overview of some of the charge density quantities that are very useful for electrostatics problems. So I hope this was helpful. This is some of the fundamentals of electrostatics and uh, practice with some of these problems and you'll find that it's going to become very intuitive and good luck with that.